Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode, video episode of the Hack Your Gut podcast. Uh, Skype is just warning me to tell you that we're recording this call so uh, that you don't come and prosecute me. So we're recording. Uh, Who I have today on the podcast is John Haas. He's the founder and chief strength officer of Warrior Fitness. He's an ACE and functional movement screen certified personal trainer. He's a Bujin Ken Ninth Dan Shidoshi martial artist, which you can explain what that is because uh, I probably even mispronounced it. And he's the author of the video slash ebook Evolve Your Breathing. I know John as we're co workers and we've collaborated on some corporate wellness projects. Uh, but tell everyone a little bit about yourself and your background. Hey, Dave. Thanks for having me on the call. I appreciate it. And uh, it's, it's Bujin Khan. So you were close. Oh, close. Very close. But, uh, Bujin Khan is a, a, a thousand year old system of martial arts that includes all sorts of different things from grappling to striking to swords and weapons and, and battlefield type arts, but also a very, very uh, profound system of health and self care uh, that includes not only uh, things like stretching and strength training, but also very advanced types of breath work and breath control for for health and wellness and for martial arts practice. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about how you moved from uh, whatever your career was in the past to what you are doing now. You have a very similar background as I do. You were working stiff and now you are helping the masses become more healthy. Definitely. I, I spent probably about 15 years uh, as a desk jockey in a cubicle uh, working in the, the accounting world, the financial services uh, industry. And then very luckily in about 2009, I was laid off from my job. And uh, as, as I sat there in my car at nine o'clock in the morning in the parking lot, wondering what to do with my life, um, I, I decided, hey, you know, I've been up to this point teaching martial arts on the weekends and, and doing strength training on the side. And, uh, you know, it would probably uh, make a, a better career choice for me to, to do that full time. So I decided that, you know, as well as me being a happier, more productive individual, I would also be able to serve society better by teaching and training and coaching people full time. Yeah, same. It's very similar situation here. It's kind of funny, though. Like, uh, you know, you move from the high stress work of working at a desk to absorbing the stress of all your clients. Uh, but, you know, in some respects, you know, it is stressful dealing with, you know, what we deal with on a day to day, trying to get people to change things that they don't want to change. But at the same time, it's also, you know, when you get, you know, even if you have a, a hundred people who don't listen, when you get that one person to just click, uh, it's super, super rewarding and it makes you, yeah, it makes you feel really, really kind of good. Absolutely. So I've been really trying to hit home about the importance of proper breathing with the members of my circadian retraining program and people in the Stop Leaky Gut Challenge. But to many people, it just seems odd that we would need to learn how to breathe again, how to relearn how to breathe. Talk a little bit about that just within the general population and some of your what experiences with clients and people who have uh, read your book. Sure, absolutely. So uh, let, me, let me back up a little bit. Um, what, I, what I had done um, for my martial arts students um, back in 2008 was I wrote a book called Warrior Fitness and that's where the entire warrior fitness training came from. And within that book, I actually began the process of discussing how breathing is a very foundational practice and actually a skill that many people don't work on. Um, and yet breathing literally underpins everything we do as far as our movement, as far as our health, um, and as far as our strength goes. So if you do not breathe properly, you cannot be said to, to be a healthy individual. You cannot be said to be a strong individual. And you also cannot move well 
and whether you play a sport or you do a martial art or just in, in general context of your life, you cannot move well, you cannot be as strong as you possibly can without understanding how critical breathing is to your entire um, human organism. Yeah, like it's, I mean, it's tremendously important for uh, everything with, with regard to your health and your well-being. Uh, and it's it's kind of the same thing, you know, you work with athletes and, you know, people doing martial arts and stuff. I'm generally kind of working with people who, you know, some of them are people who are relatively healthy. They just want to make sure that they don't get problems with their gut moving down the road. Then you get people who have these major functional gastrointestinal disorders, such as uh, irritable bowel syndrome or something, you know, something along that line, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or GERD. And, you know, it really, really just underpins how important breathing is when you start dealing with people, whether they're kind of working you know, to improve their sport and you realize they're not breathing properly. But on the same end, when you're dealing with somebody who has a health issue, you know, and when you think of something going on with your digestion, almost you're almost always thinking about, I need to take a pill to reduce the amount of acid I make. Or, you know, my gastrointestinal motility isn't very good, so I need to take something that will get the, you know, muscles in my small intestines to contract a little more to move things along. But, you know, you're kind of your warrior system for training athletes and martial arts is very similar to the kind of my thought process on working with people to improve their health simply because you can't look at digestion as just coming from your gut i mean in fact when we think about breathing and the muscles involved with breathing they are surrounding your intestines you, you know your diaphragm your, your abdominal muscles even the the muscles in your mouth when you know when you chew or breathe uh, it's really interesting that there was a study a few years ago uh, where uh, they basically had people chew their food more and what they found was when they chewed more it increased the blood flow to their gut and it improved their digestion and you know obviously that seems to be coming from the vagus nerve which is the kind of the conduit from the gut brain axis the vagus nerve is also related to breathing it serves the muscles of breathing the visceral organs including the gut and it plays a role in sensing inflammation and initiating an anti-inflammatory response to the gut systemic inflammation and you know there's so much evidence that proper breathing actually stimulates the vagus nerve somehow we don't know how that happens specifically but we just know that when people tend to begin breathing properly their movement gets better uh, they get less stressed kind of talk about what you see with movement and the stress patterns in your clients when they begin to breathe uh, better or in, in fact if you want to kind of give an example of what you see uh, is a a dysfunctional pattern in your people sure absolutely so i think that uh, you know going back to to breathing in general um and why it's important for overall health, you know, we we kind of have to understand that breathing straddles both sides of the nervous system, right? It's, it's an autonomic process. We don't think about having to breathe. You know, we don't have to remind ourselves, oh God, I have to take a breath, otherwise we die, right? Mm -hmm. So it is that it happens in the background without thought, without our involvement, and yet, we also have conscious control over our breathing. At any moment, we can choose to take a deep breath. We can choose to hold our breath. And those things, that conscious control over breathing, allows us to influence things like our heart rate, allows us to influence things like our blood pressure, allows us to have control over our stress response. And I think it's, you know, back to your initial question of why do people need to learn how to breathe? Well, do you want to be as healthy as possible? Do you want to have a lower blood pressure? Do you want to have a lower rate of stress? Do you want to be more relaxed uh, and calm in stressful situations? Then you need to learn how to control your breathing and how to uh, properly use that control to influence those things that sometimes seem out of our control. Um, you know, with regards to clients, one of the most popular things I ever say to them is 
breathe because they are holding their breath, uh, you know, when they're trying to learn a new exercise or they're concentrating on something. And even if you, um, even if you are, do not exercise, although I think you should, um, you can understand that, you know, if I'm in the process of, of signing my name on a check, right? If I'm writing an amount and I'm signing my name, I may be holding my breath as I'm doing this and then I'll finish writing the check and I'll be like, whew, God, that was stressful because I didn't realize I was unconsciously holding my breath. I had a dysfunctional pattern of breathing that's not serving me. So those, those are a couple examples of, of how this happens on a day-to-day -day basis for pretty much everyone. Yeah, it's really interesting because you have multiple avenues here. You know, first you have what you mentioned, kind of the autonomic nervous system. And if you think like the sympathetic nervous system, uh, also called the fight or flight, uh, that kind of acts like an accelerator. And uh, the vagus nerve that I mentioned is, you know, primarily how we get, you know, get the parasympathetic response that functions as the brake. So you have this kind of, you know, regulation of completely automatic processes uh, that are not really, I mean, they're, some of them are partially under your control. And interestingly enough, you know, you can kind of control your heart rate a little bit by breathing properly. You can slow it down. But you also have kind of the muscles that are, you know, mechanically helping you breathe. For example, I'm sure you've seen this exact same pattern, two patterns actually. So almost every single time I put a client into a plank, they hold their breath. And the reason they have to hold their breath is they don't lack the muscular coordination to hold that position and breathe at the same time. That's very, very, a very, very bad thing to have. Uh, basically, it just means you don't have the muscular coordination to hold that position and breathe at the same time. doesn't mean you're not strong enough. It just means you don't know how to. And in the same way, you know, if you, I, obviously, I don't recommend taking a client uh, and loading them under a squat bar with, you know, 300 pounds when you first get them. But even people doing a body weight squat, a lot of the times they will hold their breath throughout the movement, the movement because they lack the core stability to do the movement without, you know, forming this giant ball in their abdomen uh, in order to kind of move up and down without falling over or injuring their back. Uh, absolutely. And it's, it's funny you mentioned the plank um, because I had a great experience yesterday, in fact, I, I teach at the uh, at the gym that we both work at. I, I teach a class called Qigong, which is basically a system of um, Chinese energy work, and it involves mo most of it involves breathing, breathing exercises. Now, I have people who uh, have been in that class for probably about a year, maybe even more. And they don't really do any other exercise outside of that class. Um, maybe they do a, you know, some, some chair yoga or some other type of um, uh, fitness stuff, walking on a treadmill. But they don't do things like planks. And yesterday, two people who had been in my class went and joined another uh, class outside in the gym and the first thing that the instructor had them do was planks. Now, both of these people, I'm pretty sure, had never done a plank in their life. However, both of them breathed correctly and stabilized their core correctly throughout the duration of a 30-second plank, which I watched and I was astounded by. Yeah, it's crazy, too. Like, and you probably noticed this as well when you're working, like, Push-up's a great exercise, great, you know, body weight exercise. And most people think when you fail at a push-up, it's because your arms aren't strong enough. But for the ma vast majority of people I work with, it's because their core stability isn't good. You almost always kind of see their hips sag forward. They're not able to hold a perfectly straight uh, body posture. And with that, it just kind of changes the mechanics of the whole movement. Yeah, ex exactly. Exactly. I I also, um, I, I see the exact same thing, uh, as you know, and I teach my clients um, specifically how to breathe in the push-up because, like you said, it's, it's a great body weight exercise, but it's also a very simple movement. So you can use simple movements like push-ups and squats to teach correct breathing patterns because the the, the client does not have to think so much 
about the movement itself, right? It's a very simple up and down, uh, either horizontal or vertical. And you can really focus on dialing in the breathing pattern, the, the core recruitment, the core activation for um, successful movement in the squat and the push up. Yeah, precisely. And yeah, I don't like, uh, I don't typically have clients hold planks for long periods of time. I think that's kind of overrated. Doing like 30 seconds and up and down and stuff like that is fine. But you know, the people who are best at the planks can hold a good plank for five minutes. And I mean, they're obviously not holding their breath when they do that. I mean, maybe if they're Wim Hof, they are. Uh, but most people, the reason they can hold the plank for that long is that they've got the muscle coordination to be able to breathe and hold the position at the same time. Same with push ups. I'll guarantee you if you hold your breath throughout a push-up, you're not doing 50 push-ups. Uh, you'll probably crap out somewhere around 15 or 20. Uh, but, you know, there, and I think, you know, that's kind of the point. You train in a similar way to me. You know, when people come into the gym, especially if it's January 1st, they want you to load them up under a bar, have them squat or do bench presses. But for somebody who has, you know, improper breathing patterns and especially people who have problems with digestion you don't want to do that a body weight squat or a body weight push-up is better because you can actually begin by teaching them how to breathe and then how to transition them from that you know static breathing exercise into the push-up or squat and that will serve them much better than giving you know putting them under a bar with 100 pounds and having them squat up and down absolutely absolutely like like i i I say often to to my clients who um, you know sometimes come in and, and want to do exactly what you're describing. You know, first day of the workout, load up a squat bar with 300 pounds. I, I try to explain that you don't want to load dysfunction, right? You don't want to exacerbate an incorrect movement pattern or an incorrect breathing pattern by adding additional load. So what we do is, you know, like we've been discussing, take them, simplify it as much as possible and teach them the correct movement pattern combined with the correct breathing pattern so that once they can be successful in that push-up, squat, et cetera, then we can load it and we have created a stronger, more stable platform for them to build upon. Yeah, what a tremendous segue you just provided to me because those of course are voluntary movements and so yeah you want to get the proper breathing pattern so the mechanics of the voluntary movement are right and then you're breathing properly however some things are not voluntary some things are more involuntary for example digestion which you know the, you know, people from my blog are probably have been waiting to hear over the meathead talk we've been having. But it was really interesting. Last year, there was a study published linking abnormalities in the muscles of breathing in people with irritable bowel syndrome. It was really interesting. Um, the, the diaphragm and abdominal muscles play a role in breathing as well as digestion and, of course, movement as we've been talking. And they change their tone in relation to intestinal pressure. So kind of like when your breathing patterns are wrong, you change the mechanics of that whole process. And so, for example, you know, if you don't have, you know, most people can think of, you know, a strong core that's kind of tight in or, you know, the image of the person who's just letting it all hang out. That's going to, those people are going to have two tremendously different levels of digestive efficiency, specifically centered around motility. But when we look at people with irritable bowel syndrome specifically, their muscle activation patterns after eating are flipped compared to healthy people. Um, and people with uh, IBS, their diaphragm contracts and their upper abdominal muscles relax which if you think about somebody with like a bacterial overgrowth and bloating, that's exactly what you would think would happen. You kind of open up the area to kind of take in more gas, make them kind of feel like garbage. Whereas healthy controls, they have the opposite pattern. The diaphragm relaxes and the upper abdominal muscles contract, which kind of helps uh, the, uh, the gut move things along. And in IBS patients, this can lead to abdominal bloating, as I mentioned, and dyspepsia, which is just kind of, you know, like a messed up uh, gastric acid uh, secretion. But there are other issues that pop up with people who have IPS that they probably don't know are specifically related to their poor breathing patterns. We're talking about things that we generally see also in people with poor or disordered breathing, things like lower back pain, pelvic pain, 
temporomandibular joint fun- dysfunction or TMJ as most people know it, uh, chronic headaches, gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD, anxiety, depression, and pain. I'm sure you've dealt with clients over the many years you've worked uh, with that see these same issues that pop up in people with IBS. How do you see these things change with breathing exercises? You know, let's kind of take off teaching them how to squat and plank and all that stuff. Just, you know, you get this person, they have lower back pain. You're obviously not going to have them squat until you correct that and add dysfunction or uh, add strength to dysfunction. Kind of explain what you see when you correct disordered breathing and those issues. Sure. I, I, um, I had a client who had severe headaches, migraines, um, for years, and also, funnily enough, had very dysfunctional patterns of breathing. So over the course of working with her, as we began to correct those breathing patterns, chronic pain started to disappear. Uh, Her, she also was unable to to load up her squat because of um, low back pain. And as we worked on just working with the, the, the breathing patterns and trying to correct those, her headaches began to disappear, her back pain began to disappear. And I'm, I'm not saying, you know, this is magic, it didn't happen instantaneously, but over time, several weeks, a couple months, working this stuff, they, she began to see less and less symptoms of headache, less and less symptoms of low back pain, and less and less symptoms of stress and anxiety because of those things. So correcting, and the, the, the one thing that we worked on throughout every training session was her breathing. So that carryover goes through a laundry list of things you know, that you had mentioned in regards to to IBS, in regards to chronic pain and stress, low back pain, things like that. Um, And I've seen that time and time again with many people from many different walks of life. Doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter, you know, what type of work you do. uh, When we correct your breathing, when you begin breathing better, you begin experiencing less pain you begin to have greater endurance, you begin to have greater strength, all these things. But I think the most important thing for the majority of people watching here today is that chronic pain can dissipate with correct breathing. Of course, uh, we, we've discussed, um, we've kind of discussed the vagus nerve a little bit. Um, now many people don't realize all of the muscles in your body are connected to one another through something called the fascia. Some people call it the fascia, I call it fascia. Uh, many people don't realize that this basically connects the top of your head to the tip of your toe, really. And absolutely, it's just like taking a stone and throwing it into a pond. It doesn't just affect the spot where the stone hits, it ripples out everywhere. So, you know, not only, so when you have a tight or a non-functional muscle in your core, that's going to affect everywhere in your body, um, especially when you're breathing improperly. So, for example, I mentioned earlier how when we chew, you know, the jaw muscles contracting kind of feeds into the vagus nerve, which tells the gut, okay, food's coming, so we're going to send blood into that area. Um, Again, some of that's with the vagus nerve, but a lot of that is with fascial tension. And so, you know, dysfunction of the diaphragm can cause pain in many areas of the head, including the neck, jaw, and eye. And this is primarily through, you know, probably mostly through, some of it can be stress-related through the vagus nerve, but probably primarily through this tension in the fascia. And when you have, you know, certain muscles that are just not working properly, or for example, with breathing, what we generally see is people don't use the diaphragm to breathe and they use the, the muscles of the chest and shoulders to kind of, rather than kind of bow the belly out and pull the diaphragm down. They basically just use the muscles of the chest and shoulders to pull the rib cage up. And what you get is you get a lot of tension in there and it manifests itself in the neck, the jaw, uh, ocular headaches, TMJ here. Uh, people don't realize that, you know, you work with the gut. You don't think that you need to work on breathing, but you do. That's where the stuff that you are going to eat is going and you need uh, you know, this kind of uh, synchronicity between all of the muscles involved in breathing as well as eating. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, 
it's funny you mentioned the fascia advent as we as we learn more and more about this stuff about the interconnectedness of the entire body um and we look at you know something like uh a copy of anatomy trains and we can see all of the fascia laid out and all the different layers of fascia and how they connect through the whole body um if we take a look at a chinese acupuncture chart from about 2000 years ago and we lay that on top of a copy of uh anatomy trains from from today they line up very very well and it's amazing how they do but it proves that you know we have this understanding of the human body and how everything is connected and one of the things that they talk about very much in chinese medicine uh martial arts qigong yoga you know any type of ancient art um that works with health and strength is the importance of breathing and how that connects to everything you do so when we look at you know how does this you know having a, an issue in I'm holding my gut as if you could see it um but I don't think you can <laughs> but having an issue in your gut um is going to affect something like your jaw or having tightness in your gut is going to affect um chronic pain you know we look at the fascia like you have a a, a snag in your sweater right it's like you're pulling something and as you pull it it pulls throughout the entire length of material so when you have a a knot a tightness inside the the gut it's pulling through the length of material that you know can be over up in here into your head all of these things so when we work on uh creating these proper breathing patterns we not only fix the issue the local issue but we fix the issues all the way along the chain and that's the important thing i think we need to understand yeah and it kind of goes back to what you said where it's not like you just start breathing today and tomorrow you feel better you got to build up those muscles you have to change the tension in the fascia and that doesn't happen overnight one of my uh, one of my favorite illustrations of how important the fascia is in terms of how it affects everywhere throughout your body is you know if you take somebody and you have them roll a tennis ball on their foot for a minute on each or first you have them touch try attempt to touch their to toes if they can if not you know their attempt is good enough then you have a roll a tennis ball on um uh, one foot and then the other and then touch their toes again almost all the time these people get four or five inches deeper some people go from their mid shin to being able to touch the floor that's kind of an illustration of how important the fascia is and for the most part it's my opinion that for most people restrictions are in the fascia rather than the muscle but if your muscles aren't working properly you have to address that or you're not going to something as complex as breathing which we don't think about if you don't fix the muscles if you don't get the muscles activated that need to be active and you don't get the the muscles that kind of need to relax and allow length while you're breathing if you don't fix any of that you're going to be stuck into this kind of upper chest breathing um that you know It's funny that you mentioned traditional Chinese medicine and stuff like that. We like to poo-poo that stuff, but you know, they had thousands of years to kind of come up with this and they weren't watching the Kardashians. So, they came up with a fairly good model. Certainly they couldn't explain everything, but you know, it, it's not odd to me now that they're finding things like yoga and meditation are highly beneficial uh to overall health and well-being and fighting, you know, many of the chronic diseases people are seeing today. definitely definitely and if you you know if you take that a step further i think um earlier when we were talking about breath holding you mentioned wim hof and um when he is he is definitely somebody to watch in the in this space because he not only has the background of the traditional yoga and martial arts but he has the most current up to date research on breathing and wellness and looking at how um breathing affects the entire human organism and he you know he's been studied by some of the best guys on the planet um putting him through 
putting him through the the uh, the uh, ringer, you know, to to make sure that he, what he says and what actually happens are are the same. So I think that's you know a good indication that um, of research supporting these ancient um, traditions of health and wellness. Yeah, it's great. You know, I'm a guy. I want to know why, but if I know what. I don't necessarily need to know why now. You guys can hash that out. I don't think there's there's a shred of evidence that sh- says breathing properly doesn't work. I mean, everything I've seen, it's just, this is great. You need to work on this. This is great. You need to work on this. Don't necessarily have, you know, the, the, the I's dotted and the T's crossed. Uh, but it, it definitely seems like it's a high bang for your buck thing to do. I mean, even just kind of going back to the gut stuff a little bit, um, there's a link between, you know, the diaphragm and gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD mm. in that there's an area of the um, diaphragm called the crura. And this was actually studied. I'll, I'll reference all the study uh, studies probably on the YouTube page. And so basically what they did was they looked at the symptoms related to GERD in people before and after working on diaphragmatic breathing and kind of training this crura to – covers the lower esophageal sphincter, which is what's dysfunctional uh, in people who have GERD. And what the study found was there was a dramatic drop in the number of symptoms in these people simply by training the diaphragm to work properly and to maintain closure of that lower esophageal sphincter. Um, And certainly, you know, that's a mechanism. But at the same day, there I mean, breathing doesn't just do one thing, certainly a stronger diaphragm, a more functional diaphragm that isn't doesn't have these dysfunctional patterns is going to help with your digestion. I mean, everything you eat is going into that hollow cavity just beneath the diaphragm and all the muscles that surround that abdominal cavity. You absolutely need proper contraction of those muscles when you eat. Otherwise, you're going to have dysfunctional um, dysfunctional digestion, dysfunctional uh, motility and such. So, you know, I don't want to kind of sway too far away. We want to get back to your book. So I'd like to, I'd like you to kind of share, share a little morsel, maybe a, a little breathing exercise that you think is something that can kind of get people to kind of, you know, get this, you know, we talk a lot about the mind body connection, just to get them to realize how disordered their breathing may currently be do you have any sort of like uh, example exercise or test that you do with uh clients to just get get it kind of connect with them sure absolutely um i think that one of the important things that we need to realize as far as stress reduction goes is that inhalation is a somatic trigger to actually raise your blood pressure and exhalation is a somatic trigger to lower your blood pressure. Now, you can do this very simply if you choose to inhale, if you, you know, count your, check your pulse rate, right? However you do that, if you got a heart rate monitor, or if you do it old school, you know, one of these, um, you can check your po- pulse rate, you can inhale, hold your breath, and you can feel it elevate. And then wait a couple seconds, exhale and relax after exhalation and feel that lower. And you can distinctly feel the difference between the two. Now you may have to do it a couple times to get the result, but it's a very quick and easy thing you can feel. You inhale, you hold your breath, and you can feel the tension building. You can feel your shoulders maybe start to elevate. You can feel your chest start to tighten a little bit, and you can feel your pulse increase, and you can feel that pressure build. And as you exhale, relax and feel it lower and feel the tension dissipate feel your center of gravity sinking feel your body relaxing you can tell okay i've just created this response in my body i've created a relaxation response and it's a very quick and easy thing to do and you can do it anytime you choose that's the power of breathing yeah. And it gets you to focus on it as well, which, you know, is one of, you know, uh, with the mindfulness meditation, you, you're supposed to pick something to be mindful of that's in the here and the now, not in the past or the future. And uh, that's kind of a, a quick way, you know, every day, you know, if you're not 
kind of feeling, uh, you, you feel like you're stressed out to kind of do that and then just kind of bring yourself down. Um, yeah. So, uh, this has been great. So we have your book, evolve your breathing, and, um, we can look at that at www.warriorfitness.org. Correct. Correct. And uh, do you have anything else? I know you have a dad strength book. There's not a lot of dads. Most, it's primarily, um, uh, well, there are actually getting becoming a lot more fathers uh, involved with this gut problem because it's actually we're on a downward spiral in general. But uh, it, for the most part, more people are seeing the problems with their gut. But we're generally seeing uh, mostly women who are having these issues, but also men. Do you have some other programs dealing with exercise uh, or even stress management? Absolutely. Um, I have a um, entire program on qigong. Uh, called the yin of strength. So it's basically working on how to improve your your breathing. Uh, it also works on how to improve your mobility, your relaxation, and it's a, a comprehensive energy work program. So that's called the yin of strength, and that's also found at warriorfitness.org. So that combined with the evolve your breathing is a very powerful resource for stress management and uh, for breath work in general. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I actually meant to mention this earlier. I've gone to just one uh, yoga class, uh, but I've done a bunch of meditation uh, dealios. And it's so funny when you get, you can tell just kind of the stressed out people that get into these things. And even in some of the corporate wellness, when these people sit down and either do yoga or they get into the mindfulness stuff, all of a sudden, you just hear all sorts of noises coming out of their digestive tract. And it, it's almost as if, uh, you know, I said the vagus nerve work, you know, the fight or flight acts as an accelerator and the vagus nerve acts as a brake. But it's actually the opposite with the gut. So once you kind of activate that vagus nerve, improve breathing, what ends up happening is you generally get more activity in the gut. You kind of get more of the gurglies and such. And it's just really interesting. Uh I mean, next time you're in a yoga class or any sort of class where it's quiet uh, and you're just kind of all, which is normally what you see in these relaxing classes, all of a sudden you just kind of hear the gurgling and such. Um, sometimes you feel or you hear some uh, flatulence as well, which, you know, I generally try to stay in the front of the class for that purpose. But um, it's, it's just really interesting that we see these kind of gurgling noise it's almost as if these people probably haven't digested their food in a month and now that they're getting to relax they're catching up on things so thank you very much um i also actually i think i i saw on your um uh, on, on your website you do bundles and stuff so uh, is there some sort of benefit to bundling programs together uh i think i can't remember was it 50 percent off if you throw in the the qigong and the uh breathing i i, I can't remember exactly what it was Absolutely. I think there's, um, I believe there's a bundle with the, the Qigong work, the, uh, the mind body stuff, and you probably get 50% off when you get, uh, all those things together. Okay. But yeah, I, I, I would have to double check that as well. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, I was actually, I had to get uh, all the things I mispronounced, uh, at the beginning of this episode out. So I, I was skimming your site for a little bit. So thanks a lot for co coming out, kind of talking about, uh, your evolve your breathing program. And, uh, if you have, do you have anything else to say or no, this has been great. Thank cool. you so much for having me. And, uh, you know, if any of your, your people or anybody watching has any questions, please feel free to reach out. You can find me all over social media or the website and happy to help, happy to answer any questions. And uh, again, thank you so much, Dave. You're welcome. And that is John Haas, H-A-A-S, and John, J-O-N. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Take care. Bye-bye.